stop me with questions if you've got questions. Um, this is for you guys, right? Um, who am I? I've worked on Hadoop for a very long time. I've been working on it since 2006. I'm an Apache member. I've mentored a lot of different Apache projects. And mostly I work on Orc, Hive, and Hadoop. Okay, so when I was thinking about this talk, I wanted to talk about splitting up projects and then I realized there's actually a more fundamental question of, okay, you've developed a new piece of code that works with some project. Where do you start that thing? Do you ask to become a part of the big project? Do you start a new project in Apache Incubator? Apache Incubator, of course, is where new Apache projects go to, to start up. Um, where do you go and what are the trade-offs there? And what if you change your mind later? Okay, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is the Apache, well, the life cycle. Oh, by the way, of course, a lot of this applies to a lot of open source projects. Um, I'm, of course, mostly familiar with the Apache uh, methodologies, since that's the projects I've mostly worked on. Um, so people often complain that there are too many different Apache projects that do the same thing, right? They complain, oh, there's Orc and there's Parquet, there's Mesos and Yarn, there um, are a lot of different pieces. And a lot of that comes because this really is an ecosystem that we're building. And every time that there's a need, multiple people see, oh, I want to address it like this, and so they start a new piece of code. And that's where it comes from. Um, these projects really are an ecosystem, and so uh, they're basically fighting each other, but what they're competing for is community. What they want to, people to engage, they want users, they want developers. That's what makes them live or die. Um, but there's also a life cycle for projects. When they're young, they start off very fast and nimble. They can adapt quickly. They can shoot off in radically different directions when environment changes. But as they grow up, then they slow down. Um, they start valuing compatibility more than new features. And eventually, the, the releases stop. The bicycle, of course, is on there because open source projects are very much like a bicycle. If you aren't moving forward, you're about to fall over and stop making progress. Okay, so if often people's first inclination is to join an established project. Um, there are some advantages to that. You get instant name recognition, right? You're like, oh, you're part of the Hadoop project. That's great. Um, it can get you a large install base because you'll get installed along with all of Hadoop. Um, and you get a much easier way to integrate with the code bases. There are some downsides, however. In particular, you have to wait to become committers because, of course, Apache is all about um, showing that you've uh, done good work to become a committer and so you don't become a committer instantly, especially on the large projects. Actually, the large projects are notorious for requiring higher and higher bars as they get bigger and older. Um, and actually, the biggest projects are the hardest ones to become committers in. But even more importantly, you tie yourself to their release cycle. Um, this is really, really a huge problem because then all of a sudden, instead of being able to release once every month or once every three months, now you're going once a year between releases, right? Hadoop and Hive can easily go a year or two between new minor releases, never mind major releases. And so that becomes a problem. Obviously the picture is from Indiana Jones because he's about to, to merge with that boulder. Now, one of the examples of this was a little project uh, called Hadoop Record IO. It was an early serialization library uh, that implemented Hadoop's writable classes for you. It was put into Hadoop, and no one ever made very much noise about it. Um, so basically, everyone has it, 
almost no one knows it's there. It's been deprecated for however many years, but um, we can't delete it because when we tried, they used, there were some users and they started screaming at us, please don't delete that. We use it in production all the time and all our data is written in it. So, um, another example uh, comes from Hive. We just, uh, a few years ago, started the LAP project. LAP stands for Live Long and Process. Of course, it's a takeoff on Live Long and Prosper. Um, but yeah, our marketing team, very unhappy with us. They, they were like, what the hell are you doing calling it LAP? But that's why engineers get to pick the names and not uh, marketing teams. Um, so it does a lot of cool things. It basically has long living daemons that uh, can run Hive queries and basically turns it into a distributed database. Um, it avoids the JDK startup costs because I don't know if you know this, but every time you start a new JDK, it, um, it takes at least a second before it starts running very quickly and it'll cache the hot data in memory. Um, so the biggest thing here was that it was really just part of the Hive community. Uh, it was the Hive community doing it. It had a really tightly integrated uh, code base. And so we decided, okay, we're just going to put that into the project itself. Okay, separate but together. Now, one of the pieces that people don't often realize is that there is actually a third option. Uh, Apache projects can have multiple releasable subprojects, which Apache Commons is the canonical example. Uh, it allows for separate release trains and bug tracking and source version control. So there the question you really have to ask yourself is, do the two communities overlap significantly? Um, we actually did this. Uh, there's a new project coming out of HDFS team called Hadoop Ozone. And it's a basically a distributed key value store. It's got overlapping communities. It integrates well uh, with HDFS. Although in that case, it actually isn't integrated tightly with HDFS. They originally designed it that way. And the HDFS committers pushed back strongly and said, no, don't just destabilize our project by putting your code in here. <laughs> Even if it's configured off, we don't want to, to debug your code because it's messing up our code. Um, but it needed faster releases than Hadoop. So actually I worked with them and just convinced them to make a independently releasable sub project. Um, and so they're actually going to make their own release train. So that instead of waiting until uh, Hadoop 3.2, they can release immediately. Another advantage, of course, is that that'll allow them to work with the older Hadoop versions. Okay, and finally, there's starting a new project that lets you control your own life cycle in terms of releases. You get the excitement of a new project. You get to go out and evangelize. And you have to address the integration immediately, right? So you have to say early on, this is how we're integrating. We're going to consider these interfaces and um, how to, to deal with that. And the one thing you do need to consider, though, is in the long term, uh, will your development community be big enough to actually uh, survive? You see this with some older projects um, where they actually have a hard time getting uh, three vote voters to validate a release so they can actually make a release. Avro was a project that uh, started uh, back in 2010, and it's a serialization library. Uh, it started as an independent project, um, it, which allowed it to do frequent release cycles, and it picked up a lot of projects outside of Hadoop. So this was actually a really good use case for having a separate project. The one challenge, of course, is that there was a really complicated dependency tree for Hadoop and only really stabilized once. Um, Hadoop and Avro both got stable enough that those interfaces stopped changing. When they were both changing, it made a complete mess. Tez, on the other hand, uh, was an execution engine we did for Hive. Um, it 
was a replacement for the old MapReduce, so we were like, okay, well, let's start as a separate project. That actually was a pretty bad call because there's basically a one-to-one -one correspondence between each version of Hive to a version of Tez. So they're releasing at the same time and they're pretty tightly integrated. And actually it's a lot of the same people working on both. So we could have done better there. Okay. Um, when we were originally coding the, the ORC project, we considered where to put it. However, during the decision, we were watching the, the Hive list and we saw that uh, a, another format was trying to get Hive bindings into Hive and the Hive community pushed back. In particular, one particular developer was like, no, we don't need another file format, go away. And we're like, oh shit, <laughs> we've got this file format we've been working on, we really want to integrate it with Hive. That's not good. Uh, so we renamed it to, to ORC because it's optimized RC file and the guy who was complaining was the guy who wrote RC file and uh, we decided to become part of Hive. Um, and that helped the Hive work integration a lot. However, uh, ORC being inside of Hive was really hurting adoption. Other projects didn't want to pick up ORC because that meant they had to pick up all of the classes of Hive as a dependency. Um, it was viewed as only useful for Hive. And part of the other piece was that um, projects viewed ORC as um, being so tied to Hive that other projects' needs wouldn't be taken seriously. And that kind of naturally happens. Um, when you start looking at other projects and, okay, what do they need? You're less likely to take it seriously if you're buried inside of a big project. Um, another problem was that we had some new C++ code. That C++ code was coming in and had its own set of committers. And we wanted to keep the two code bases together. And Hive doesn't have any C++, and so that wasn't a good match. And we wanted to release more often. So we decided to split it out. And in spite of all my learnings about how hard it was, now my coworker is doing the same thing with the Hive Metastore for almost exactly the same reasons. In particular, he wants to boost adoption by other projects. Okay, so what did we do? The first thing that you need to do is make a module of the code. And you need to decide whether you're at the top or the bottom of the dependency tree, um, make heavy use of interfaces and plugins, and minimize the amount of code duplication. However, with ORC, we were in the middle, and that kind of sucks. Um, so, oh, actually, I want to do this in a different order. Um, so, ORC depended on 16,000 classes. That's excluding uh, all of Hadoop and Protobuf. And so, I took a shot at it and failed. Someone else took a shot at it and failed. Um, basically, things were just too tangled up. So, we actually built some tooling to help us. And in particular, it uh, used one of the dependency analyzers to figure out um, which classes depend on which, cl which other classes. And so it started from the root of the ORC classes, excluded all the Java, Hadoop, and Protobuf, and then uh, produced a dependency graph that told us uh, what things were depending on. Now, just doing that, of course, the 16,000 was a huge list and hard to work through. So what we did was we sorted that list by the distance they were away from the ORC classes and then the second key was how many classes they transitively depended on. That actually helped us really focus the, our attention on the, the most problematic classes and work forward from there. Um, now, part of that was we had to define some new APIs. In particular, Orc had used object, Hive's object inspectors, which was easy because we were in the middle of Hive. Um, but Hive's object inspectors had a huge dependency set downstream. And so we had to, to remove that. Now, fortunately, we had also put in fast uh, vectorized methods. Vectorized in this case are methods, are the ability to process batches of a thousand rows at once instead of row by row. So 
we decided, okay, we can get rid of all the object inspector methods, just leave the, um, the vectorized methods, and then put into Hive a compatibility layer so that the old users wouldn't break. Okay, so that got us down to around 40 classes or so. Um, that was, um, those 40 classes were actually critical for Hive. We couldn't just pull them into ORC because there were things like the internal memory representation that Hive uses when it's processing. So no one would be very happy if we pulled those into a, a different uh, project. We created a sub-project called Storage API and that releases the rest independently of Hive. So we can release it more often. We can, um, it has its own branches. The current storage API version is 2.6.1 while Hive is 3.0.0. It was a little confusing while they were exactly, for a while they were exactly one off of each other. So Hadoop, or sorry, Hive 2.3 uses storage API 2.4, which confused some people. Okay, now I go back to this other one. Okay, so after you get your project done and split apart into that separate module, now you can actually uh, copy that code to a new code repository and rename the, the projects. Um, actually in work, we screwed this up. We renamed the uh, packages while it was still in Hive and that was a huge mistake because then we ended up with compatibility issues as we released the, the code. Then the new project needs to make a release of the code and the old project needs to come in uh, and make the switch. Okay, sorry, I should have put these in a better order. Now, for some history, <laughs> This isn't the first time we've tried to split up a project. 10 years ago, we tried to split up Hadoop into three uh, distinct pieces, common HDFS and MapReduce. Of course, now you'd throw Yarn into that list as well. Um, but part of what we screwed up is we weren't paying attention to the communities. Yeah, those made sense from a technical point of view, but there was actually no community for common. <laughs> right? People were either HDFS devs or MapReduce devs. There were a few of us that did both, but, but there was no one that was, felt like they were a common developer. And so we actually, I think, would have been better off keeping it just as two, where we had HDFS and MapReduce and the common stuff was just in HDFS. Um, that would have also cut down the number of cross-project um, dependencies. Um, we were also using Ant and Ivy, which made that hard. Ivy would pull down the, the jars that you needed, but it was a lot less straightforward to publish those jars uh, compared to using Maven. And so it made the cross project uh, code relatively hard and uh, made it, so basically it uh, was hard to release this way. And our failure of adequately planning made it worse. Um, and so we split it apart, we created separate code repos, separate JIRAs, everything. And then a few years later, we pulled them back together because it was just not working for us. And so we uh, put it back together. But as a result of all this, because Yarn wasn't ready yet and Hadoop is something that only makes sense to release at scale, um, then you ended up, we ended up blocking the HDFS release for a few years um, with waiting for Yarn to get releasable. And that was pretty uncool, actually. Okay, so I had a boss at one point who um, was aware of Apache and didn't always get the finer nuances. And so one of his favorite plans at one point was, oh, we can split apart this project and we'll just take the committers that worked on this code base and that'll be great because there's only good guys on this list and none of the bozos over there. That doesn't work. At Apache, at least, there's just no way to pull that off. Um, 
what always, always happens is that you end up giving everyone who has commit bits before you pull them out the commit bit after, the, after you pull it out. And so you end up with a lot of people who haven't worked on the, the uh, code with uh, commit bits. And actually, I thought we were mostly <laughs> going to avoid that with org. But even there, the people were um, fighting to, to be committers. And so we ended up just saying, fine. <laughs> if you're a committer on Hive at that point, then you can automatically become a committer on, on org. And so that when we split, at least half of the committers on org had no patches in the code base, um, which is kind of a strange place to be. It also means that org has a large number of committers relative to its code base size. Um, however, uh, what you can do is start aggressively recruiting, right? You will need to go out and um, talk about your project, talk about what it why it's good, why people should be using it, and you need to accept that. And you need to be welcome and friendly. Like I said, part of the challenge is that large projects will often be hard to become a committer. Well, on small projects, you often put the commit bar very low because you're trying to encourage people, right? And people get very encouraged when they become a committer after putting in uh, some patches. And, and you want to be welcome and friendly. And, so we do that. OK, so <laughs> large open source projects. This isn't obvious until you've lived it. But large open source projects become very, very political, especially Actually, I can only talk about Apache projects. <laughs> Apache projects, because they're democracies, act like democracies everywhere, and so they're gets to be a lot of, OK, we need to be nice to that person so that they vote with us on that. And um, it means that you become very, very aware of it. For small projects, that fortunately just goes away. right? You can just be focus on your project, focus on your community. And I've got to say that it's been a really nice change. Um, Faster builds, right? Orc builds in a few minutes instead of hours. Actually, it's close to 24 hours, I think, to do a, a build of, of um, Hive and get all the unit tests passing. Um, well, to get that unit test run, to get them built uh, and passing takes much longer. Uh, faster release cycle. It takes months to get a Hive release out the door, right? To go from, oh, we should start making a branch to make a release. It takes months. Yeah, I can roll a orc release in a matter of days. <laughs> Actually, one day. Um, and so that means that you can make, you can make releases much more care, uh, quickly and be much more responsive to your users. Now, granted, it's a smaller community, so you need to pay attention. Hey, we haven't released for a while. We should do that. Uh, but eventually, the users will say, hey, you've got those great features over there. Can we get a release? And then that'll come up. It's much easier for newcomers to pick up code. When we split out, the first thing I noticed was people were coming in with these little small patches that did interesting things that would have never come and touched it, if it when it was buried in the middle of Hive. Because changing Hive is scary, right? You're like, oh shit, what did I break? <laughs> but changing Orc, you've got a, a much smaller code base with a set of unit tests that test things out. And so you're much more confident making changes. Um, and you end up spending a lot more time on outreach and documentation, right? Um, although it feels really good anytime someone says, oh, the Orc website is so good compared to the Hive website. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so it would be a good investment anyway, but it's definitely one of the things that comes up. OK, challenges of small projects, especially in this split out. Backwards compatibility is crucial, right? Um, you have, because now those changes are going across uh, projects, and especially with storage API, <laughs> uh, we really, really need to, to make sure that we don't break backwards compatibility. Another of the challenges is that, uh, at least right now, Hive and Orc are actually really good tests for each other. And so anytime storage API releases, I don't actually, 
plus one until I've made an ORC release based on that. And often I'll check with the older versions of ORC to make sure that the, they haven't introduced um, API breakages. Um, and correspondingly, ORC releases are tested with Hive. That one we actually screwed up recently, which is embarrassing. Um, we didn't, 1.5.0 broke Hive, and so we needed to release 1.5.1, <laughs> like two days later. <laughs> um, but, but it's good to have the extra tests. Um, and cross project changes require extra work. So if we make a change to storage API that's going to affect ORC, then we need to make three releases, right? We make storage API, release, ORC release, and um, then a Hive release to get the flow all the way through. Now, that does introduce some delay. Um, Apache projects typically use 72 hours for a vote, although in practice, we've run, there's a, one release where we made a storage API release and an ORC release concurrently. So basically, we started the, the votes at the same time, and then they finished 72 hours later. So actually, that it doesn't necessarily introduce extra latency. It just means there's extra work. Okay, so some final conclusions. Your first priority has to be the community, right? When you're deciding where to put this thing, think about who the people who are going to be working on it, who are the people who are going to be using it. That has to be your first consideration. Um, all the times we've made the right call, it's been about the community. Now, as we said, we also have, you have to think about the size of the community. If it's a too small a project, then it'll be really hard to get those three plus ones you need to make a release, and that becomes a problem. And you're trying to get the project to this, the point where people just start contributing uh, and so that you reach critical mass and you start get patches flowing in. You also have to consider how tight the integration is going to be. Good tight integration has good properties and bad properties, although um, after spending too many months separating work out, I can definitely see the bad properties. <laughs> and consider the tools that are available, right? If you have Maven, that's good. C++, your tools are much more limited for dependency management, and so that becomes a lot more problematic. And finally, don't worry if you make, if you decide you messed up and you need to, to change things or the environment changed, you can always change your mind. Okay, any questions? Yeah, thank you, Owen. So, uh, any questions for Owen? I have one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you avoid politics, and what are the key signs? Uh. Suddenly, it's a question of politics <laughs> and not about code. <laughs> so, how do you avoid politics? Um, to be fair, there's. I haven't found a good way of avoiding politics in in the large projects. Right, working on making smaller projects out of the bigger projects actually does help a lot because you've um, made the, the pool that you're fighting over much smaller. <laughs> um, where if you have a very large project, then the politics get very extreme, right? The, um, the projects with multiple hundreds of committers, you're going to have politics. There's just no way to, to avoid that. Um, and you just try to keep the politics clean, <laughs> right? You don't want company-based politics, for example, right? At Apache, that's a big no-no. Uh, you never want to tell your, your uh, coworkers how they should be voting, <laughs> for example. Um, but you're always going to have politics. And sorry, what was the second piece of your question? Yeah, um, if, if they are, what are the first signs of politics? Like when you have a small project and you, you suddenly you realize, well, is it about code or is it about <laughs> politics? It, so it usually comes up when there, there's some discussion about adding a new feature. Uh, so it becomes those kind of discussions. Um, when people either try to shut down one group because they don't like how think the direction that they're going, um, or um, someone's trying to be too controlling of making new committers, right? So actually watching the committer inflow 
is actually a critical sign of, of a project that's working well. Um, if there's no committers being added, that's a sign that the politics have gone pretty bad. Questions? Okay. Thank you, Owen. Thank you. I'm really appreciate. And oh. I'm sorry, oh, I didn't more. see that. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm yeah, I wanted to know how do you uh, increase the adoption of your project and uh, how do you reach out to other contributors to come and uh, take a look at your project and start contributing? So actually, you, you do a lot of things like going to meetups, uh, give talks about it, try to get people excited about what's going on in your project. So it, it's that kind of stuff, right? Giving talks about it, um, talking to people, um, and just um, keep the project flowing, right? If it's addressing new needs, and actually talking to the users about what they would like to see in the project. One of the pieces that I've seen a lot is that people have a big need to take these highly complex data structures and um, that they currently are getting as JSON and put them into a structured file format. Um, and they're doing it badly right now because there aren't very good solutions. And so one of the pieces that came out of that is like, oh, actually we should do that and that will help drive adoption. Another one, for example, is um, people want protection over some columns, right? They want to say, okay, only some people are allowed to read this column because it's PII. So we're in the middle of adding column encryption, for example. So um, mostly, and then of course you give more talks about, <laughs> about those features as they go in and try to get people excited. So mostly it's that and make sure that when people come in that you're welcoming and friendly to them, right? That, that's actually really critical, right? You don't want people to get disgusted with your community and, and go away because that uh, percolates rather badly. <laughs> Open source projects are, are a relatively small community and, and the words will get around, right? If projects have reputations for being friendly, that's great. And if they get reputations for being not friendly, that, that's bad. Oh, there's another one question down there. So I was wondering if you have any idea if one can use um, splitting projects to manage deprecation cycles of old components? Or is that an evil approach to begin with? So let's say you have some, some component you don't want people to use, like your record IO, right? Would you consider splitting that out into some project on life support? Or is um, that not good? <laughs> so we've talked about that, especially in the context of Hadoop, of uh, splitting projects out, especially ones that uh, are not used very much. Although, again, because the community isn't there, especially for the ones on life support, I would actually encourage you to go instead to the model where there are separate sub project that releases independently. So, for example, Hadoop really should do that with MapReduce, right? MapReduce basically never changes. Actually, Record IO would be another great example of that. And so if we just release them independently, um, then they, can, can fall off <laughs> into um, disuse at their own rate, but I wouldn't split them off as a separate project because there's no community and, and so it'll be hard to maintain. Does that make sense? Great. Any more questions? Well, thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.